بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا وحبيبنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان فمن شهد منكم الشهر فليصم صدق الله العظيم As it was announced before also that inshallah today's session will be devoted for the month of Ramadan we'll be talking about things to do during the month of Ramadan or do's and don'ts of the month of Ramadan and of course that will be limited to the main points we cannot go into all the details of it just like we cannot talk about the details of Salah in one session same way we cannot talk about the details of fasting, Ramadan, Atikaf, Salah, uh, Salat al-Taraweeh, Tahajjud, all in one session. But inshallah we will try to cover the important points about these things. As far as the importance of the month of Ramadan, we all know it. And there are many ayahs of the Quran al Kareem about it, many ahadiths of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that talk in detail about it. For example, there is a hadith in Sahih al Bukhari. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man sama Ramadan iman and wa ihtisab and ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhambi. Whoever will fast during the month of Ramadan under the two conditions, one is he has iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is must for all the ibadahs, and the second is ihtisaban. Hoping to get the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which means the person corrects his intention before starting the fasting. All of his previous sins will be forgiven. Which is of course a great virtue that all the sins will be forgiven by fasting these 29 or 30 days. In another hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, As-siyamu junnah, fast are shield. So fasting really is a protection against the evils, against the fitnas, against shaitan al rajim against the fitna of shaitan. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us, As-siyamu junnah, fasting is a shield. But there are certain things that will break this shield. And therefore Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advises us in the same hadith which is in Sahih al-Bukhari that when a person is fasting, فَلَا يَرْفِثْ He should not talk of any intimate relationship, any sexual desires. وَلَا يَجْهَلْ And the person should not fight, argue and get in these type of disagreements where there is uh, any type of argument or fighting is involved. If a person tries to argue with him or fight with him, أو شاتما, a person tries to curse at him, instead of replying to that person, he should say, إِنِّي صَائِمْ I'm fasting. So therefore I cannot argue back with you. I cannot fight with you. I'm fasting. In fact, really is a beautiful way of reminding the other person, especially during the month of Ramadan, that we know that everyone is fasting and a person gets upset starts cursing at someone else if we just tell him at that time that I'm fasting in other words you are telling him that what you are doing at this time is against fasting and since you are fasting you better stop doing this also really these are the things that will of course not break the fast but take all the importance reward and the effect of the fast away from the person remember the main thing in the ibadahs is not the physical outlook of the ibadah. The main thing in the ibadah is the real spirit of the ibadah and the uh, effect of the ibadah. But of course, 
the physical outlook of the ibadah has to be kept the way Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us without making any changes into it. But with that, we need to get the effect of the ibadah in, on our souls and have the impact of those type of services that we perform for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on our lives. Otherwise, it's just an action that means nothing, just like other religions have some of their dogmas, they have some of their ways uh, that they consider it way of worship. When they get together in their churches, synagogues or temples, you see them performing so many things. There is no spirit behind those things. There is no value behind those things. There is no effect behind those things. So the main thing in all the ibadahs is the effect of the ibadah. And the effect of the ibadah comes by, number one, making sure that all the ibadah that we are performing is only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number two, not doing anything that will hurt the effect of the ibadah. Remember, there are two different things. One is there are things that will affect the existence of the ibadah. That will affect the existence of the ibadah. What is fasting? Fasting has three things. Number one, stop from eating. Number two, stop from drinking. Number three, stop from having intimate relationship. These are the three things that fall into the definition of fasting. So outlook of the ibadah is a person has to stop doing these three things. As soon as the person will do any of these three things, that person have broke his fast because he went against the definition of fasting. Except, of course, we know about eating and drinking if the person would do it by mistake. Uh, not by mistake, I should say. If the person will do it uh, uh, forgetfully, then his fast does not break. So, that's the outlook of the ibadah. And the ibadah will break, this ibadah that is called fasting, will break by either eating Number two, drinking or having intimate relationship. But as these things will break, will break the ibadah itself and the outlook of the ibadah, same thing, any type of sin, backbiting, fighting, arguing, cursing, lying, all of these things will break the effect of the ibadah. And this is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reminding us in this hadith which is in Sahih al-Bukhari that as Jannah, fasting is a shield. Shield against what? Against the shaitan al-rajim. If a person in his normal day-to-day -day life will have his schedule such, especially in these days, if our schedule is such that we have breakfast before we leave home and a person has to leave home early in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning, and then he gets his dinner only after he comes back from work, and that is about 5, 6 o'clock in the evening. So the person, in other words, is just like fasting. He's spending the time from dawn to sunset without eating and drinking and having intimate relationship. So it just looks like, it looks like a fasting. But that stopping from these things will not give him the effect of the fasting. The reason is, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Ihtisaban, the person has to have his intention. And he has to do the intention, have the intention, that I'm doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once he will have that intention, then he has to stop doing the other things also, that will break the effect of the fast. So this is a very important point that many times, we do not keep in mind at the time of performing an ibadah. For example, a person comes to perform the salah. One is the outlook of the salah, that is, Allahu Akbar, reciting Qur'an, thana, Qur'an, ruku', sujood, tashahud, salam, all of these things, this is the outlook of the salah. Once the person has done all of these things, we will tell him that your salah is good. But, the person was not concentrating in his salah. He was thinking about something else in his salah. So, as long as he did not do anything that will break his salah, we will tell him your salah was, looked okay and it should be good. So, the outlook of the salah was good, but the spread of the salah is not there. The th effect of the salah is not there. Now, this is not the type of salah about which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Tanha anil fahsha wal munkar. It will prevent him from doing evils and from doing 
shameful actions. The reason is the main spread of the Salah was missing and the effect of the Salah was not there. So same thing with our Ibadah. So even with our fasting, we have to make sure we keep the effect of the fasting. And keeping the effect of the fasting is this is what, uh, how to keep it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is teaching us that same thing in this hadith which is in Sahih al-Bukhari. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Asawma Jannah. Fasting is a shield. And when a person is fasting, Fala yarfuth. He should not talk about intimate relationship. Wala yajhal. He should not get involved into fights and arguments. And this is a very important point also to remember in Quran and Hadith. And even in Arabic language generally, the word for arguments and for fighting normally that is used is jahl. Wala yajhal, normally, literally jahl means to be ignorant. In other words, Getting involved in these type of cursing, fighting, arguments is all jahl, is all ignorance. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, Wala yajhal, and the person should not be ignorant, which means he should not get involved into fighting arguments. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another ayah of Quran al kareem وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا when a jahil talks to him, which means a person tries to argue with him or tries to curse at him, he says, Salama, peace. Assalamu alaikum. I don't want to argue. So the word jahil is used for arguments and fights in Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Wa imra'un qatala, if a person tries to argue with him, aw shatama, a person tries to fight with him or argue with him, curse at him. <coughs> He should say, Inni sa'im, I'm fasting. So therefore, I cannot do it now. Another hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَخَلُوفُ فَمِسْ سَائِمْ أَطْيَبُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ مِنْ رِيحِ الْمِسْكِ The smell that comes from the mouth of a fasting person is dearer to Allah than the fragrance of a musk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves that smell. The reason is, the person stopped eating and drinking for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in appreciation to that, He loved even the smell that comes from the mouth of the fasting person. And there are many other virtues in the hadith, but I'm sure many of you know many other hadith about the virtues and know the ayahs, and at least we all know the importance of fasting at least during the month of Ramadan. And nevertheless, we know it is one of the pillars of Islam and is faridah, just like any other faraid of Islam. So therefore, there cannot be any doubt about fasting, about keeping the fast, or there cannot even be a second thought whether we should fast or not. That's something we have to do it. As Muslims, we have to do it. There is no second opinion about it and then no one can give it a second thought. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in the hadith. In fact, Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa sallam read this. That fasting went through three different stages. There were three major changes made, were made into fasting in Islam. The first major change was made that in the beginning of Islam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to fast Ashura. The fasting of Ashura was fard, and he also used to fast three days of every month, 13th, 14th, and 15th. Then when the fasting of the month of Ramadan became fard, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, now the fasting of Ashura has been abrogated. So therefore, we do not have to fast for Ashura, which simply means from there on, fasting of Ashura became nafil, and fasting of Ramadan became fard before that fasting of Ashura was fard. The second major change. In the beginning of Islam, the order was, وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ طَعَامُ مِسْكِينَ Even those who can afford to fast, if they decide not to fast during the month of Ramadan, 
so they can feed a poor person. And that will be the ransom for not fasting. So it wasn't only for sick people, it wasn't only for traveling person. Any person who doesn't feel like fasting, does not want to fast for any reason or no reason, he can just feed a person and that will be just that will be enough for his fasting. Then the order was revealed, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْ Whoever witnesses the month of Ramadan must fast during the month of Ramadan except if the person is sick or the person is traveling. The second major change that was made. In the beginning of Islam, when fasting during the month of Ramadan became fard, the order was people are allowed to keep on eating and drinking and <laughs> of course having intimate relationship as long as, of course that's before dawn, as long as they do not sleep. As soon as the person went to sleep, even if that was for a minute, you fall asleep, you cannot eat suhoor. That's it. Then your fast will stand from the time you would sleep. This order, of course, was a very difficult order. In other words, it was a teaching for Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een that do not sleep till suhoor. A way of teaching them. Remember, if you have a paper that's folded and you want to keep the paper straight, a paper is folded and if you try to keep it straight and you just open it up and by opening you try to keep it straight, it won't stay straight. So the way of keeping it straight will be that you twist the paper all the way to the other side. Then try to keep it straight. Then it will stay straight. Same thing. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to teach Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een how to perform these different ibadahs properly. He was taking them to the other side. Folding them totally 180 degrees to the other side. From not fasting at all, now fasting and even fasting with this restriction. That you cannot sleep. Why? Because he wanted them to get used to staying awake during the nights of Ramadan. And for that he told them, he gave them all the encouragement to eat the suhoor. He's telling them eating of the suhoor is a barakah. He's telling them the difference between our fast and the fasting of the Jews is eating the suhoor. They don't eat when we eat suhoor. At the same time he's telling them, if you go to sleep you cannot eat suhoor. That simply means you cannot sleep till the time of suhoor. And after suhoor is the time for Salat al-Fajr. So don't sleep till Salat al-Fajr. Once he saw them, now he got, they got used to it. Now they learned how to do the ibadah during the month of Ramadan. And once the person will get used to it, he will do it once and he will get the beauty of it. Then you tell him it's not necessary to do it. He would say, that's fine. Can I at least do it? As we ask, do I have to do it? And if I have to do it, then I would do it. Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'in. Then they would ask, at least is, uh, am I allowed to do it? He's saying you don't have to do it. Am I allowed to do it? If I'm allowed, then I would do it. So this is what he's teaching them. So in the beginning of Islam, that was the deadline, dawn, or if you sleep before dawn. And so happened, during one of the Ramadan, one of the Ramadans, one of the Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa whose name was Surma radiyallahu anhu, he came from work tired. He did not want to go home to break fast and perform salah at home, of course, Sahaba Ridwanullahi Ali Majma'in, they wanted to be in the masjid. So he went straight from work to masjid. He was very tired that day. He broke his fast in the masjid, performed salat al-maghrib in the masjid, and he did not feel like going home till Isha. 
So he stayed in the Masjid Tal Isha. He performed Salat Al Isha with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Of course, in those days, we didn't have people could not afford to bring food in the masjid and all of them getting together, although it happened sometimes. But it wasn't something normally that will happen every day that some people are bringing the food and everyone is eating in the masjid. So normally even the food that people would bring is someone will bring some dates and give it to the people. They will break their fast. So all he had was a date. He's very hungry. He's extremely tired. The food is ready at home. He came to the masjid. He broke his fast with one date. Perform Salat al-Maghrib, continue doing the Ibadah, reciting Qur'an till Isha, perform Salat al-Isha. After Salat al-Isha, he went home. The wife went to warm the food for him and he's very tired as he was sitting. He went to sleep. When she came back to him with the food, she woke him up, he cannot eat. Extremely difficult situation. Of course, those were the people that had no questioning. He knew that now my fast is started, that's it. So he started the fast. Next day in Fajr, he's in the masjid. In Zuhar, he's in the masjid. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, looking at his face, he asked him, Surma, you look extremely tired today. What's the matter, Surma? Are you upset? Something is wrong? He said, No, Ya Rasulullah, and explained the whole situation to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After that, the ayah of Quran al Karim was revealed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Uhilla lakum layla tis siya layla tis siya mir rafathu ila nisaikum, hunna libasul lakum wantum libasul lahun. That now during the night of Ramadan, you are allowed to have relationship with your wives, which simply means eating, drinking, all of it is allowed till dawn. So sleeping has no effect from there on. But of course, the encouragement still is there and the teaching is still is there that try to spend the whole night if you can or most of the night if you can in the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing the ibadah, performing salah, tasbihat, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, allahu akbar, istighfar, sending blessings on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, reciting Quran al kareem and all of these different types of ibadahs. So these were three major changes that were made into fasting. Also, when talking about fasting, we need to remember there are certain things that will really take the effect of fast totally away. And one of those things that hurts the fasting the most is any type of haram food. A person who's fasting the whole day, at the end of the day, he eats something that was haram. He uses his haram earning. Or that food itself is haram. That's it. The whole fast is gone. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in the hadith, by eating just a handful of haram, the ibadah of 40 days is not accepted. The ibadah of 40 days is not accepted by just a handful of haram. None of the dua is accepted. As Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in another hadith, that a person traveling, he has dirty clothes, and the reason he's mentioning all of this because a poor person with dirty cloth, he will have more sin sincerity when he's praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person who's traveling, his dua is accepted also. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that person goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he prays to Allah, he repents to Allah and he says, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi. Keeps on praying to Allah, oh Allah, oh Allah, oh Allah. I need this, I want this, this. Ya Allah, forgive my sin, forgive my, uh, all of my sins. 
رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم says but ومطعمه حرام whatever he was eating was haram whatever he was drinking was haram what he's dressing is haram فَنَّا يُسْتَجَابُ لَهُ how would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept his dua which simply means everything that will help dua being accepted is there he's poor he's his situation is bad, he's traveling, and he's repenting to Allah, he's crying, and he's begging. But, because of that haram that he has, the haram thing that he's using, none of those things are working. And nothing works. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us in another hadith, مَا نَبَتَ لَحْمٌ مِنْ سُحْتٍ إِلَّا وَالنَّارُ أَوْلَى بِهِ Whichever piece of flesh has grown from haram, and is built of haram, is mixed with haram, it deserves to be thrown in the hellfire. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, once he was giving a lesson of hadith in the masjid, hundreds of his students are sitting and learning, and he sees a child who came in the masjid. The child did certain actions in the masjid. By looking at those actions, of the child, he says, this child's parents have committed a major sin. People, of course, there are always people who will talk about these things, who will transfer the message from here to there. They went and talked to the parents of the child. He came to him, started arguing. He said, I can guarantee you that two of you or one of you have committed some major sin. And when they started digging into it, they found out that really the mother had committed a major sin. This wasn't the child of a halal, of the same marriage. Just by the deeds of the child, he was able to tell that. A fact of what parents have done. So of course the same thing, effect of what goes into the body, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, it affects. Just one handful will prevent the ibadah 40 days from being accepted. The dua of 40 days will be rejected. Salah of 40 days is rejected. Fasting of 40 days is rejected. So this is one of the very important things that we have to keep in mind. Not to use anything from haram. Use solely the halal source and halal income and halal food that has no doubt into it. At least for this month of Ramadan and around the month of Ramadan because once we get used to it during this month and we start learning how to be careful during this time, inshallah, then we will never go into it again for the rest of our lives. Very quickly, few things about fasting, a few masail about fasting. Generally, when you try to see the categories of fasting, there will be two different categories of fasting. One is called the necessary fast, fard or wajib, and the second is nafil fast. Out of the fard fast or wajib fast, there are two types of fast. One is the type of fast that is specified with a time. There is a time specified for it. And the other is no time specified for it. Examples. The fasting of the month of Ramadan. The time is specified. The month of Ramadan. This is the time for it. <clears throat> Second example. A person makes a vow. He owes, makes an oath. To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that if this will happen, I would fast, and he specifies the day, I would fast next Jum'ah. I will fast three days of every month, 13, 14, and 15th of every month. If he has specified that, then this fast has a special, specific days that it has to be fasted on. So, again, going back. Two different categories of fasting. One is necessary, the other is 
which is optional, nafl. The necessary fast can be divided into two different categories. One is the one that is specified with certain time, like Ramadan or like the fasting that was specified when a person taking an oath for fasting it. The days were specified, the date was specified. Number two, the type of fasting that is wajib nafl, uh, wajib or fard, which is necessary, but the days are not specified. For example, the qada of the month of Ramadan. There are no days specified for a person who missed the fasting of the month of Ramadan. That is, the days are not specified. Throughout the year, any time you can fast it. Or a person who makes an oath that if, I would, if this will happen, I would fast for two days, three days, for one month, two months. But he does not specify the days. The difference between these fasting, always remember, those fasting that are specified, the days are specified for that fasting, if a person delays the intention of that fasting from dawn, a subh sadiq from dawn, and he even makes the intention later on, as long as he makes the intention before noon, and uh, noon means before the time of Zohar begins, that person's fast is valid. Because that day is specified for this fasting. But if the day is not specified for that fasting, now remember another rule. Whenever any day is not specified for fasting, then nafil is the uh, that day is specified for nafil fasting. Today, for example, I did not is not Ramadan, and I did not even make an oath of fasting today. Therefore, what should be today's fast? Nafal. So today's fast is specified for nafal. Other than the month of Ramadan. Throughout the year, the 11 months other than Ramadan. All of them are specified to be for nafal. Except if the person will wow, will make an oath of fasting on that day for some other fast. So then he have changed the situation of that day from nafil to something else. Now going back to the rule. If the fast is specified for a certain day. Then you can make the intention for that fast till noon. If the fast is not specified for that day. Then you have to make the intention before dawn. At the, before the time of suhoor ends. If you want. It will be nafil fast, but your fast for that specific thing will not be accepted because in the beginning of the day, the fast started as nafil. You cannot change it now. This is the reason Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sometime he would go home. And he would ask one of his wives, is there any food at home? She would say, no ya Rasulullah, there is no food. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say, Inni idhan lasa'im. Then I'm fasting. Then I would fast because it's almost noon time. It's 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. Now I don't have to eat anything till Maghrib. Inni idhan lasa'im. Then I will continue and I will fast today. Because that day was specified for nafil. So I would continue with his nafil fast. This is a very easy rule to remember. And if you remember it, it will solve all the problems of when to make the intention. So this is one thing that we need to remember about fasting, which is basically about intention of the fasting. As far as breaking the fast, of course we know the traveler is allowed not to fast. If he would fast, his fast is going to be acceptable. He fasts for the month of Ramadan, he makes an intention, I'm fasting, his fast is okay. Because... He is not told not to fast. He is given a permission not to fast. And if he would choose to fast, then there is nothing wrong with that and he is allowed to fast. Sick person is allowed not to fast. Yet he decides to fast. He is allowed to fast. But of course, 
If a person will not fast in these situations, then he has to make up for that fast some other time in the year. Second rule. A person started his fast. We were talking about a person who is, he did not, he, cho- he chose not to fast. But now, a different situation. A person decided, a person decided to fast. And now later on, he wants to break his fast. So if he's breaking it because of one of these two reasons, either he's sick or he's traveling, he cannot continue his fast, he does not want to continue with his fast, he's allowed not to fast and break his fast. That thing is allowed to do it. Of course, if he does that, it's still the same ruling, he has to make up for that one fast, two fast, as many as he did not keep later on in the year. But, the situation now changed. A person who started fasting and without any of these valid reasons in the Sharia, he broke his fast. In this situation, and intentionally, remember, that will be the condition. Intentionally, he broke the fast. In this situation, he has to pay the ransom for his fasting, and that is fasting for two months. The first thing is, of course, is freeing a slave, which we don't have nowadays, unfortunately, because there is no jihad. So freeing a slave. If there is no slave, if he cannot do that for any reason, then the second thing is to fast for two months. Number three, if he cannot even fast for these two months, then he will ca- he, he's allowed to go to the third option, and that is feeding 60 poor people, which simply means feeding or giving out to poor people the amount equivalent to feeding 60 people, which means even if he gives one person the amount equivalent to feeding 60 people, that will be enough for him. But he will have to wait for 60 days for that person. So, feeding 60 people. That's the third ransom, third choice he has in paying the ransom. After the two months, then he will be fasting for making up for whatever he uh, did not fast for the month of Ramadan or broke the fast during the month of Ramadan. So, remember two conditions. One is, he started the fast and then broke the fast. <coughs> Number two, he did it intentionally. And that was during the month of Ramadan. In that case, he will have to pay the ransom. And as I said, the ransom is one of these three things. There is a very informative joke there. From the hadith. Rasulul is a fact, but really... Is a joke uh, type of fact. A Sahabi came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I was fasting and I had a relationship with my wife. With my wife. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Bad. You have to now free a slave. I don't have it, Ya Rasulullah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, then you have to fast for two months. He said, Ya Rasulullah, if this one fast did all of this to me, and I couldn't control my soul, just imagine what would happen to me for two months. I can't do it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, then you have to go and feed 60 people. Ya Rasulullah, I can't afford it. I have nothing. Okay, sit down. He sat down. A person came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with some sadaqat. He gave it to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called that sahabi and he said, go ahead, take this and give it to the poor people. He says, A'ala afqara minni ya Rasulullah. Can I find in Medina a, more, a poor person who is more poor than me? I'm the poorest person in Medina. You want me to go and feed other people? <laughs> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Okay, go ahead and take it for yourself and feed your family. But this is only for you. No one after you is allowed to do this. So, 
that person was given a special permit at that time from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he could move from the second choice to the third choice and then even in the third choice he could eat it for himself we cannot do those things and the reason I mention this is sometimes we might read the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi's way as we normally talk about Bukhari Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi's way of narrating the hadith is that he normally 99% of the time does not narrate the full hadith he will narrate the partial hadith. This is his way. And Muhaddisin always know his way of narrating the hadith. And therefore, when he narrated this hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, he just narrated the first part. He did not narrate the last part that says this is only for you. Now a person will read the translation. He will say, that's good. I'll do the thing. I'll break the fast and then pay myself for it. So that was when a person breaks the fast intentionally, he has to pay the ransom and then he has to make up for those fasts also. Generally keep in mind that the things that will break the fast are generally anything that's against the, this definition of fasting and the definition of fasting is stopping from eating, drinking an intimate relationship. These are the things that will break the fast. Anything against this will break the fast. And anything which does not fall into this category should not break the fast. That's the general rule. And then there can be many other things. Uh, questions can come to your mind or anything. You can ask those questions. Basically, these were some important things that I could remember this time about fasting and about the rules of fasting. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين والمسلمات